You're listening to the Running in Production podcast, where developers and engineers talk about their tech stacks, lessons learned, and general tips from running web apps in production. Here's Nick and today's guest. Welcome to Running in Production. Today I'm with Mark Wilbur, who is running Phoenix in production, and Phoenix is a web framework written in Elixir. Mark, welcome to the show. Hey there, thanks. It's great to be on, especially after hearing uh, another Elixir user a couple episodes ago. I learned so much from his stuff on the forums. Check out that first episode, everybody. Thanks. Yeah, that was a great one to check out. So do you want to start off by um, introducing yourself and letting people know a little bit about the app that we're going to be going over today? Yeah, sure. Um, so my name's Mark. Um, I have been in software for a while, although my my first career was teaching English, actually. I uh, ran a WordPress blog for a while and then you know, learned some CSS and then JavaScript after that. And then I worked at a tech startup in Beijing, then uh, three and a half years in the Bay Area, pretty much doing all JavaScript. And recently, I have been mostly working with Elixir. So when it comes to Elixir, uh, what application are you running in production? Right now, it's a site called alchemist.camp. And it's actually a site that exists just to host tutorials and support people who are learning the Elixir language and learning to work with the Phoenix framework. Hmm. So the whole platform that you built then that's running Elixir and, and Phoenix. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a little bit recursive. I actually used some of the uh, material of building the platform itself as teaching material for the, the listeners. So do you want to go over just very briefly, like, you know, what type of videos or articles that you put on that site, just so people know the type of app that we're dealing with? Yeah, sure thing. So it's it, initially it was just videos, just screencasts of Elixir programming. And then over time, I added more and more sections of the site. So there are articles on it. I'm also hosting podcasts on it and or not hosting the audio themselves, but show notes and, and that kind of thing. And there are a few other, actually, there are several other pieces to it, like uh, um, feature voting. So users can request what they want to learn next and uh, what sorts of changes they would like to see to the site itself. Then some uh, gamification and Easter eggs and variety of things. But at its heart, it's just a content site that hosts articles and screencasts. Nice. And uh I actually used a couple of your videos to learn tidbits about Elixir and Phoenix. So some of your videos are free, but others are not. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. So I started with a YouTube channel before the site, and I was just excited about Elixir. I wanted to teach some of the things I'd learned working on my previous startup. And after you know making videos for a few months, I ask people like, hey, would you be interested in a premium version of this? And I can make a whole site and uh, build out you know, more features and like really invest some time into it. And after getting a, a positive reaction, I, I built the site itself, or I, I built the premium part of the site last June. So that would be almost a year and a half ago. Nice. And is it, uh, is it just you working on the project or? It's, it's just me. I, I, in fact, I, I finally spent the first money uh, ever contracting something else to be done, and that was just a new logo for a, a side project related to it. Oh, okay. So development-wise, it's just you cranking out code, Elixir code. Pretty much. Bit of JavaScript. Little bit of JavaScript. Hey, you can't help it, right? <laughs> Definitely not. So what motivated you to use uh, Elixir and Phoenix in the first place? For this project, it was because it's what I knew. And uh, I, I also had quite a bit of experience with uh, full stack JavaScript. But based on my previous experience, I thought it was what I could do the most quickly. Hmm, that makes sense. So were there some features of Phoenix that just like really meshed well with the type of application that you have? With this one, I, I wouldn't say necessarily. I, I think the current, uh, I mean, I think Alchemist Camp is not, it's not anything that difficult. Like I could have just as easily used, say, Rails or Laravel or like any backend MVC framework and 
done pretty much the same thing, but I know Elixir better than I know either of them. Um, I am using channels for a couple of things, but it's not, I mean, it's only a tiny bit. I think uh, really didn't have to be Elixir. Okay. So I guess with that said, um, if you rewrote your app today, like from scratch, would you still reach for Phoenix then? Oh, I definitely would because the uh, just the speed of development has been fantastic for me. Uh, I do think that if if I had equal amounts of experience with something like Rails, uh, I would probably be able to build even faster with it just because of the the larger ecosystem of libraries. Um, I do have a fair amount of Ruby experience though, so it's not like I haven't dug in at all. But right. there are some. There's some things about Elixir that are really nice, uh, well, and Phoenix both, that are really nice once you've got a larger app because there isn't really any magic, as they, as they say in Rails. Like if Even if you're using macros, you just scroll up to the top of your module and you can see every, mo every macro that's being used, everything that could be affecting the code you're looking at. And I think Ecto is all Ecto is the uh, the data mapper or like like their ORM although it's not really an ORM. Ecto is a lot more explicit than Active Record is. So you really don't get surprised by how much you're preloading or how much is being done behind the scenes. It's it's fairly explicit which is a little bit more time way at the beginning but not that much more and at least for me it's been much easier to debug than JavaScript or Rails or P. Although I was never that good at PHP, but it's easier than it had been with any of those environments. Yeah, and that's also something um, I spoke with Gabriel about in the first Elixir podcast, where it's like the initial development time is uh, usually very small in relation to the amount of maintenance time that you're gonna, you know, really develop your app for years uh, down the line. So it's important to have those things in place that just make code a little bit easier to navigate and uh, maintain in the future. Yeah, I think as long as it's not a huge hit to productivity. Uh, I, I mean, I think the reason why Rails and Laravel are so huge is because people can get things built so quickly. So I wouldn't want to, you know, I wouldn't want to go too far down the other route and make some really enterprisey thing uh, when I don't even know if there's any demand for what I'm making. Right. So there's definitely that that balance to account for. Yeah, I just felt like Phoenix is a really good balance, and I still do. I I think it's basically my go-to for a web app. Okay. So is that Phoenix application now, is that a monolithic application, or do you have it broken up into uh, microservices or, or even like umbrella apps in, in Elixir? Uh, it is, uh, I guess it is a monolith, although... I don't think Phoenix really pushes you to be that monolithic in that uh, since 1.3, they they kind of uh, nudge you towards domain-driven development. So even though it's not broken into an umbrella app, it is, or into multiple umbrella apps, it's it's still got separated contexts. And, it, and I think the way the code base is designed or the way that, that the framework pushes you to design it by default can scale pretty far. I mean, there, there's a point where if you have enough engineers, like you really have a big advantage in microservices, but this is never going to be that situation. This is only me working on it right now. Perhaps if it grew a great deal, there would be you know, a couple other people working on it, but I, I don't see multiple people working on the back end in any likely scenario. Right. That makes sense. And, and just to give... Uh, listeners an idea of the scope of your app like do you have any idea off the top of your head like generally like you know you're probably not going to know like a line count of it but i mean like what's give or take like the scope of the app itself um one second i, I can just get that with git uh, it's if you so if, I, if i'm excluding everything that's git ignored so basically the uh the dependencies and uh, the JavaScript dependencies, it's 242 modules and okay. about 10,000 lines of code. Yep. So that's actually, you know, that's a pretty reasonable size app because like we said before, it's like, you know, Phoenix does, you know, you can be quite productive with it. You do need to write a little bit more code than what you would with Rails, but that's that's still a healthy size app. It's good to see that it's still, 
very usable as a, a monolithic application. Yeah, I, I don't really, I mean, you know, GitHub is a monolith, so I, I don't really worry that much about having a monolith. Um, you know, I, I read like the famous Steve Yegi rant about Amazon and you know, moving everything to microservices. I totally get that, but I, at least if, if you are a solo developer or a very small team, new startup, I really don't see why people would worry about having a monolith. There's a, I remember a blog post I read a long time ago. It's like, you're not Google unless you're Google. Well, yeah. And then, and then everything's different. Right. Monolithic app working out very well. Uh, are you using server render templates with just little bits of sprinkles of JavaScript or is it API based with like some type of JS heavy front end? None of it has a JS heavy front end. Uh, some of it is API based though. I've got a lot of different things I'm working on it. Cause I, I also, since it's just me working on it, I can pretty much tinker on anything people are interested in. And one of the feature requests that came in through that feature voting system I mentioned was an API for video downloads for premium subscribers that just want to have an API to get whatever they want. And I'm, I'm not exactly sure what the, uh, what the purpose of that is for the, the subscribers in question, but there is interest in it. So mm. I've, I've got a bit of an API side to it too, that I'm working on, but it's, uh, yeah, the site itself is all server side rendered and I haven't even used turbo links. Like I, I did that with the previous Phoenix app that I wrote, but it turns out that, you know, with the amount of content on this one and the fact that it is a content site, the, uh, you know, the performance has been okay. You know, like it, I think, I think in terms of u user experience, at least, if not UI, uh, it's working out fine. Yeah. So I've, you know, I've browsed around your site, clicking links and things like that. And it's always very speedy. Like I didn't look at the network tab to see the actual latency, but you know, it was never something I even thought about. Yeah. I, th I think the next step for me would be paginating all the episodes. Cause right now I'm just loading up over a hundred on the same page. <laughs> <laughs> right. Are you using any, um, like Phoenix specific, uh, I guess you can call them tools like channels and, and live view. Not using live view at all. Uh, it's, it's still not stable yet. In fact, I haven't even done a tutorial on it, although that's, that's up soon. Um, I want to, you know, I don't want to adopt it and then have too much change and then create more work for myself. Like one of my, one of my core motivations and building this the way I have is just that when I started, I had pretty severe repetitive stress injuries in my wrists. And I just couldn't spend more than about 10 hours a week at the keyboard. So I've, I've tried to keep things as, as uh, easy on myself as possible, even though now my, my wrists are quite a bit better. Um, just don't want to make extra work for myself. I guess I just got that habit. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. And, uh, you know, this isn't a podcast about bad mouthing other technologies, but like, you know, if you go with a JS heavy friend and suddenly, at least I found it's like, you need to really keep up on that like all the time. It's very hard. Well, that, that was my, that was my full-time job for, for years. And I don't actually have anything against that kind of framework. I think it's just, it makes more sense as you have a larger business and you can afford more employees. If, if you have, especially if you have different people working on the front and back end, I think it makes a ton of sense. So yeah, def definitely not bad mouthing it. I'm just, uh, just doing it the easier way uh, as I get started. And, you know, the, I would say the, the complexity of the site has been gradually increasing. And um, I very well may write a separated front end at some point. No, I love it. It's just very pragmatic about it. It's like when the problem comes, then uh, deal with it then, if it even comes. So what does the rest of your tech stack look like? Like, uh, what database are you using? Postgres. And that's pretty strongly encouraged by Phoenix. It's just the standard, the default. So, and on the server, I was initially just, I was initially just running Phoenix directly, but now I've got Nginx in front of it. Um, that's not for any performance or, or caching reason, but I did it because it made it easier to deal with uh, Let's Encrypt certificates. That, that was actually the primary motivation. <laughs> 
Yeah, I've always been a fan of using Nginx for that. Because otherwise it's like, you know, if you're going to deal with SSL termination at the app level, then it's like every app that you make, you need to implement that. Whereas with Nginx, it's like you just do it once and like you can literally copy paste that around to other applications, like just the configuration part. Yeah. And, and I think if Phoenix were more popular, there would be like there would be a, a library to do that for you, as I believe there is for Laravel, for example, or for Rails, which is not even PHP based. But it's still, yeah, it's just easy to go with uh, Nginx because so many people use it and there's so much support for it. Yeah. So are, are you running, um, well, are you serving your assets through Nginx as well? Yeah. In fact, that was what I just wanted to interrupt with. Um, I'm also using Nginx for, uh, comp- like, there's some uh, assets that I'm compressing with Brotly, and I'm not sure that's supported with Phoenix yet. Okay. So basically, like, a gzip alternative. Yeah, right. I should say it is supported with Phoenix, but I would have to have my the, I would have to be doing the compression myself some other way. Whereas with Nginx, there's a module that will just do it on the fly. Hmm. Yeah. I wonder if um, I wonder if that will make its way into what is it, the Phoenix Digest command? Like maybe it can output Bratly files or whatever at some point. That was that was my my first plan was actually to just do that through the JavaScript side. But it turned out easier to just install an Nginx module. So, are, is your application running inside of, of Docker or no? It's not. Uh, I am actually now using Docker in the deployment process, though. So, the way that I initially deployed it was uh, literally just using Distillery, which is uh, an Elixir library, to build uh, an Elixir release and then. I was using set caps so that I could run it on port 80. And I wrote a very tiny script. I may, may have copy pasted a very tiny script that would start the new release. And that was, that was all I was doing. Uh, then I moved to using a tool called eDeliver, which is kind of interesting because it, it's basically a pile of, of uh, SSH scripts itself, but it will let you build a release remotely. So say uh, on my, my home machine, I've got my, my repo. And when I want to build a release, I use this eDeliver command and it will SSH into my server, build the release on the server, then move it into the proper place and start it. That was step two. And that's actually not a bad workflow. Once you've got it set up and working, it just, uh, you know, just one command to, uh, to build and one to deliver and one to start, or you can, can combine it all into one command, send an upgrade and start it immediately. Um, it does support both the uh, releases and the upgrades, which use Erlang's hot upgrade feature. So you can actually deliver the upgrade without starting and stopping the server. So is that, is that something that you do, or do you just use the regular releases? I'm using upgrades. So... Uh, what I'm doing now is I'm still using eDeliver, but instead of using it from my own server, I'm using GitLab CI CD. And GitLab is creating a Docker container. So every every time I push to uh, any branch, it will build my app and it'll run the tests. If the tests pass and it was a master branch, then it will use eDeliver from the Docker container it built to deliver the app from there to production. And I have uh, SSH keys in my GitLab environment. Hmm. That's a pretty cool setup. So then on the server itself, you're actually not running Docker. It's just basically just used in your CI environment. Not running Docker on the server. Um, I am using systemd and I'm using, uh, I forgot what the name of the library. I think the, the library was just called pid underscore ex. I'm using a uh, an Elixir library that will give your Elixir app a PID file and then just using standard system D tools to make sure the uh, the release gets started, say if there were uh, like a hardware restart or something like that. So speaking of um, system D then, uh, what distro are you using on your server? Uh, Ubuntu, I think I just upgraded to 18.04. Okay, so that's as of... Uh, right now, late 2019, that's the, the LTS release. Yeah, I was on 16.04 for most of the life of the of the project. Hmm. 
So that's pretty fresh upgrade, but I don't know exactly when 1804 is going to be... Well, I, I guess, what does the LT, T, LTS uh, last for? Is it five years? I forget. I'm not sure. Um, it's not something I've had too many problems with or had to worry about too much. Um, but I am, you know, obviously I, I do... I do keep track a little bit, and I'm uh, my backup strategy may not be as elaborate as some. I've basically just logged everything that I I've installed on the machine, and I have weekly and daily backups. That's basically about it. Is everything then? Is it all running on on one box somewhere? Or speaking of boxes, like you know, where are you are you hosting this? Initially, it was on Amazon, but then when I moved to using eDeliver, I moved to DigitalOcean. Okay. Yeah, I'm a big fan of DigitalOcean. It's where I host most of my stuff. It's worked great for me, and it's it's actually, uh, at least from my perspective, it's it's actually less of a hassle to deal with than Amazon is. So it's like a, a better price-performance deal, and it's less work. Right. Yeah, there's definitely trade-offs to be made. I, I, have, I have actually been leaning towards using render for my next project though render do you want to give us the tldr on that yeah it's a it's a pretty new startup started by uh, an ex-stripe engineer and it's uh basically it's like a modern version of Her heroku like what it was it's it's uh, extremely easy to use I've, I've never used anything that's made it so easy to deploy as uh, as render and it, it costs more than DigitalOcean because they're managing everything for you. But it doesn't cost as much as Heroku. So I, th I think uh, it's a, a pretty clear win if you do want everything taken care of for you. Hmm. That sounds really interesting because a lot of people I've spoke with in the past, they're, they're always like, well, I love the idea of Heroku because it makes it so easy for me to deploy my app. But I hate the idea of having to pay like you know, literally 10 times more than what it would cost to self-host it, potentially even more in some cases. I think the I think Heroku's price performance got a lot worse after they got acquired by Salesforce. Like it used to be their their actually their free tier was good enough to do most hobby projects. And maybe, you know, with with the amount of traffic I have now, uh, maybe like in 2011 or 2012 I could have been on their hobby tier and it would have been fine. So for that server that you provision, so you mentioned you kind of keep tabs of what you've run on the server. Are you then not using uh, configuration management tools like Ansible? I'm setting up Ansible. I'm in the process of doing that. Nice. So have you done a little bit of research on it before? I've used it before, but it was a few years ago. So it's it's not exactly my wheelhouse, but I, you know, I'm not. It's not completely alien to me either. Right. Yeah. I think pretty much how it is for a lot of developers. It's like developing your app is only such a small slice of what you need to do to actually get it up there and, and running in production. It's like there's a whole side of like server management stuff that is a very, very, very deep rabbit hole. Yeah, I, I, yeah, it's definitely true. And I think it's definitely worth spending time on. And it's, it's also worth spending time learning about. Um, my general strategy has been do everything manually at first. And after it's something that comes up repeatedly, then, you know, then I automate it. So for the first, I think, first nine months of running the site, I was doing password resets manually. Like people were emailing me saying, hey, I forgot my password. And then I would say, well, now it's, you know, purple tree 74. Right. And then, you know, after, after it had happened three or four times, I automated it. But it, you know, there's so many little things like that, that I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to spend too much time up front, although, you know, now it's clear to me um, I, I am possibly going to be moving it to different, you know, different uh, machines or be doing other things with it. And it, it's worth investing more time in the infrastructure. Yeah, for sure. So you mentioned Postgres, but DigitalOcean also has their own like managed Postgres now. Are you using that or you just have that running on the same box? Got it running on the same box. Okay. Yeah, so, definitely nothing wrong with that. I yeah. It, well, this is another thing where, based on the amount of so, just for clarity, it's the site's getting about twelve thousand visitors per month. It it's you know it depends a bit on on whether if there's a spike in uh, in traffic from Hacker News or something like that. But um, 
that's you know the range that I expect it. And I'm I'm not logging my analytics on my own site. I uh, delegated that to Keen.io. Uh, although that's going to end this month since they're uh, they're terminating their legacy plans. So I don't have anything where I'm I'm like writing you know more rows in the database every single time someone visits. Right. But speaking of that, um, are you keeping tabs a little bit on the telemetry stuff that's supposedly coming into Phoenix? I've been reading about it, but I haven't uh, haven't dug into it at all. Yeah. So a couple of weeks ago, Chris McCord, the author of Phoenix, he was on a podcast where he was like, maybe on the horizon, that was his time frame, on the horizon, hopefully, hopefully within months, <laughs> he wants to... Um, you know, go all out and create that live view dashboard of where you can just like go to an endpoint of your app and then start to see all sorts of stats about, you know, the Beam VM and even things like Ecto queries and basically anything that you want to add as your own events. So if you wanted to track like, you know, how many users signed up or something like that, um, from what it looks like, that would be a very, very, very easy thing to add to your app. Yeah. And I think that's great. Like I, I prefer to have analytics on a separate machine, yeah. but I, I think, uh, yeah, I, I think the more that's built in, the more, you know, the more accessible everything is. And I would use that too as a default before, uh, uh, before bothering to check uh, external analytics. I've been checking like uh, digital oceans health stats. Like that's, that's basically what I keep track of. Like when I, uh, when I do load testing, uh, something like that, I'll see, you know, what is the utilization of different things. Or uh, the the last time the uh, an article on the site got to the front page of Hacker News, I looked at, you know, what like how much of the memory was being used, how much uh, how much of the bandwidth, like, am I close to anything breaking? And so far, like even that was probably about a factor of a hundred off from anything breaking. So I'm not too worried about it. Like I want to, I want to provision for say 10 X my current traffic peak, but I don't want to provision for the apocalypse. <laughs> right. Yeah. I think, I don't know, at least I did at, at the beginning. It's like, it's very easy to underestimate like just how much traffic you can serve from one server, especially if you're using, you know, a web framework or whatever, that's pretty efficient when it comes to IO stuff. And, you know, 2019 hardware is, is pretty fast. Yeah, definitely. So speaking of hardware, uh, what are the specs of your server? Well, I have upgraded to the $10 DigitalOcean box. It's on the $5 one. Yeah, it was on the $5 one, which is fine for serving it. But I have a couple of other projects on the same box. One of those is a really heavy front end. It's uh, it's basically a React, Apollo, and uh, Redux front end, and the back end is Elixir and Absinthe. So it's like a typical full blown separation. But the front end was big enough on that. I was actually running into some problems with uh, just the total memory. So just just building it, like not not deploying it, not anything else. So I, right. I went up to the ten dollar box, and and actually um, at that point, I decided Alchemist Camp was. Uh, it was enough of a thing that it was worth being on its own machine. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome that it, it graduated to its own machine. Yes. Now, that $10 a month box, that has, does it have two gigs of RAM on it? I think that's right. I think so. Yeah. Do you happen to know offhand, like you don't need to look it up, but like how much RAM the uh, the Phoenix app uses, like when it's just running? I don't know offhand. It's It's not a really high percentage though. Okay, so maybe like a couple hundred, if that, maybe. Yeah, yeah, and I'm using ETS, uh, which is basically it's a it's a in memory cache of my episodes on the site. So that the way that I've set it up, I'm flushing that out at regular intervals, and the more different episodes that are visited within an interval of time, the larger that cache will be. But it's still okay. not. It's not getting anywhere, uh, not not getting anywhere near the limit, and I actually did not use that cache for the articles, which are basically analogous to the episodes in terms of what needs to be served uh, from my server. Although the the uh, episodes are also loading in YouTube videos, and I didn't use any caching on the articles, so I actually didn't need any caching on the episodes. But I haven't 
gotten around to removing that. Hmm. Yeah, I was just going to ask you that. It's like, did that caching of the episodes come out of need or was it just more of just like an experiment? Well, I think that that was uh, partially your thread on the Elixir forum about the site. Um, oh, wait, no, no, no. I, I did the caching first. Then you asked a thread about it. Then I, I uh, you know, did what I could to see see what I could do to improve the performance. Um, oh, yeah. I feel like such a jerk about that. Nah, too, it's all good. <laughs> No, I remember using um, the work tool just to send like a lots of traffic to your site, and it's like, hey, what the hell? I have like eleven, you know, like eleven thousand visits to the site in eight seconds. You're you're not the only one. I, I think it was actually a really stupid thing for me to make a YouTube video showing a whole bunch of people learning the framework, how I'm load testing my own site, because other people started load testing my site. Um, yeah. it's, it's not a, it's not a huge number, but you're, you're far from the only one. Yeah. It, it was, uh, no, it was, it was a good experience cause I, I, uh, learned about how, uh, the, uh, ETS works, like at least, uh, at least well enough to, uh, to set up the cache and it's actually really easy to do It's it's actually much easier than say reaching for Redis and doing something outside the app there weren't any problems from doing it actually. Um, and it did improve the performance, but in the particular case of my app, the, uh, the bottleneck there was I've basically, I've got an extended version of Markdown for editing all of the content on the site, like the, the articles or the, the screencast episodes. And I was doing the conversion from the Markdown to HTML every single time a page loaded. So I started caching that for the episodes and that improved the performance quite a bit. But then with other similar kinds of content like the pure text articles, uh, I was still doing the same markdown transformation, but I just started storing the, uh, the result of the transformation, transformation in the database and only, you know, only actually doing the markdown to HTML conversion when the, the content itself was edited as opposed to any time it was viewed. And that completely eliminated the need for the in-memory cache. I'm sure at some right. level of traffic, I, you know, the, the cache could be really useful, but it's not needed. So you basically moved the compilation to compile time instead of runtime. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. So are you, are you using the CacheX library for this uh, caching of the episodes or no? I would actually have to look at it to be sure. I've uh, I did that a while ago. I, th I think probably I was I was using like whatever the most common one was. Right. Yeah. I think that's the one. So a little a while back, you said you used to do like password resets manually. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so maybe now we can talk a little bit about like some maybe external SaaS tools that your app depends on. Sure. So like what are you using for uh, transactional email? I'm using Amazon SES for transactional email. And that's like, that takes care of like registration and password reset emails, things like that. Yep. Registration, password reset, notification about uh, quest progress on some of the, the uh, Easter eggs in the app, that kind of thing. Yeah. Amazon SES is pretty cool. What is it like a, a thousand emails for 10 cents? I think. I'm not even sure. Like I, I think the, I've never seen a bill more than a few cents. Right. Yeah, I'm the same way. I love that. It's like, you did all this stuff and it's like 32 cents. Yeah, it definitely wasn't fun setting up. Like that that was more frustrating than I've seen with other transactional email services. Oh, but yeah. once it's set up, it's incredibly cheap. Especially with all that like DNS, like validation for DKIM and like all this other crazy stuff. Yeah, it was a whole whole episode. Yeah. I, I remember after validating, I could also only send from my own email or to my own email address at first. And I had to do something else. So yeah, it was, it was annoying, but that, that set up. Um, I also do marketing emails, which have been through MailChimp, but I'm in the progress or in the process of moving them all to convert kit right now. Um, as I said, I've been using keen.io for event analytics. I'm also in the progress of migrating that right now to uh, my own service, which is basically going to be the same kind of thing, except just exactly what I need. It'll be running on my other DigitalOcean box and a managed database for that one, though. 
because event analytics databases are going to fill up really quickly. Definitely. Very fast. So I like ConvertKit. Um, I think their product is awesome, but it, yeah, it's a little bit pricey, but what they do is, is really, really good. Yeah. Well, it, it really depends on what kind of business you have. Um, for me, uh, I'm not, I'm not actually really big into email marketing, but since I am running an educational site, it is pretty important. And if I, you know, say if I email everyone who signs up based on, you know, what they said their Elixir experience was, I email them uh, things that are useful for people at their level, you know, once every week or twice a week or something like that for just a while to get them started. I think people both remember the site and come back and they, they actually learn more too. I've, I've had a, especially with people that have paid, I've, I've had a, a couple of depressing email exchanges where I, I asked people like, Hey, you know, you've been on alchemist camp for a whole year now. Like what, what's your level at now? And what are you working on? And, um, it's not the normal response, but once in a while people will say like, Oh, I, I actually haven't done anything yet, but I plan to. Right. And I just feel bad about, you know, have it like, I, I feel like I've provided nothing because, because I didn't use it. Right. Yeah. That totally makes sense. And definitely happens in this industry. Well, like this type of niche. Yeah, yeah. So what about uh, payment providers? Are you using Stripe or something else? I am using Stripe now. At the beginning, it was just one-off payments with PayPal. But then after the first round of people signed up in the alpha launch, I added Stripe using Stripe billing and a really low-level API wrapper library called Stripey for Elixir. Nice. So then if people want to sign up um, and become like a paying member, is Stripe, is that the only gateway that you provide? Like you can't do it automatically through PayPal? I don't have it set up to do that. And that's just because I haven't spent the time to do the, the API integration. I do have a few customers, especially in Brazil. I'm not sure why, but a few customers that have said Stripe refuses our credit cards. So for those customers, I just offer them uh, a billing setup with PayPal and I, I go into PayPal and I, I manually set up a recurring invoice from their, just from their GUI. And I send that to the user and then they pay it and I manually make them a member. Right. Yeah. I think that's a good way to go about it too. Cause it's like integrating PayPal and then also getting it seamlessly working with Stripe at the code level. That's a pretty big undertaking. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's also getting bigger because of, uh, new regulations, like uh, I think it was called SCA in the EU. They're uh, yep. like, we can't use the, the old Stripe billing API for too much longer. Got to move to, uh, I think, payment intense API. Yes. Cause back in the day before SCA, it was like doing a, a single transaction with like the charge API. It was so, so easy and straightforward, but now it's like so many things you need to account for. Like literally the user could you know, optionally have to enter in like some, you know, bank pin code during the transaction time. So there's a lot of like front end and back end communication that needs to happen. Yeah. I think the, the barrier for entry, um, actually for business and also for, for programming in general seems to be going up. Like the, uh, the amount that people need to know at the entry level is, is, uh, kind of surprising. Yeah, for sure. Cause I mean, I had quite a lot of trouble getting payment intent set up in, uh, an app that I was building, like it wasn't like trouble, trouble, like, oh my God, I can't do it, but it took way longer than I anticipated. Yeah. Yeah. As for other potential SaaS tools, like, so like logging, logging and metrics and stuff like that, error reporting, do you have any like third party tools for that? Or is it just all like log files on the server and, and stuff like that? It's all pretty old school, like log files on the server. Right. No, that's totally cool. It works. Are you using anything like uh digital oceans alerting system? I am, but I don't remember too many details about it from when I set it up. I was, I was a while back. Oh, okay. So like the TLDR on DO's alerting system, it's like, um, you can have certain things set up where it's like, if the CPU limit goes above like 80% for five minutes, then you can get an email and they have these alerts for like disk space and memory. It's kind of nice. It just helps you sleep a little bit better at night. Yep. So you have all of that set up for those different like alert types. Yep. Exactly that. Now, did you do that through some CLI or did, was all of that through the GUI? Uh, yeah, I just used their admin dashboard. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's all through the GUI. But there, there might be API endpoints for that. Um, I have never looked. It would seem like there would be because I used to use a, a service called Nanobox. Actually, DigitalOcean bought later, but it was basically like uh, for people who don't know too much about Docker or or don't dig into it very deeply, it would set up your your system uh, on a Docker container and do the deploys to uh, do the deploys for you to DigitalOcean or AWS or Google. And they had really nice dashboards that I think was all coming from DigitalOcean. Interesting. Yeah, DigitalOcean's API is pretty cool. So earlier you were talking about um, SSL certificates. Mm -hmm. You're using Let's Encrypt or something else? I'm using Let's Encrypt, just CertBot. I only bring that up because um, with DigitalOcean's API, like, I don't know, actually, this is a follow-up question. So do you have your DNS records? Are they hosted on DigitalOcean as well? Yeah. Yeah, so their their API is pretty cool when it comes to like doing the uh, DNS based validation for Let's Encrypt. So you can just make an API call. Uh, Let's Encrypt puts its like details as a text entry, and then it like removes it after it gets verified. It's pretty neat. Oh no, I'm not using that. I'm I'm just uh, I'm just using the uh, um, the cert bot, and I, I think it set up a cron script for me, or or a cron job, or possibly I did, so that right. you know every. Like every time it's a month before expiring, it requests again. Yeah. I really love the Let's Encrypt servers, especially, I don't know if this was there from the beginning, but you, do you know you can register a certificate with an email address? And then if your certificate ever fails to get renewed, then they will email you and be like, hey, look, your your certificate's going to expire in like two weeks and then one week and then a couple of days. It's been that way for as long as I've been using it. And the reason I know that is because my WordPress blogs, which are not hosted on DigitalOcean, or at least they weren't then, uh, were on another host, and it was a, a shared host where I didn't have all the permissions that, that you'd have on a VPS, and the renewal was failing. And I found out about it because uh, Let's Encrypt was uh, emailing me before, before it, uh, it happened, right. so it saved a lot of hassle. Big time. So speaking of like failures and disasters and all that great stuff, I know earlier you mentioned you're doing, what was it, daily database backups? Yeah, daily and weekly uh, whole image backups on DigitalOcean. Is that through their uh, like automated backup thing or did you yeah, do the, that separately? The weekly, the weekly one is, a, is their automated backup. And then I've got a script that I'm running daily. Now, I don't know this off the top of my head, but that auto backup thing, what is it, like an extra 5 or 10% that you pay on, on the price? I was thinking it was a full dollar. Maybe, right? Yeah, yeah, because I was paying $6 a month instead of 5 so either it's 20% or it's a one-off $1. Yeah, I think it's 20% because it's tied into the specs of the server. When it comes to the database backups, um, is that just like a crown job, like doing a SQL dump or something like that? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's what I do too because it's like, you know, if, unless you're dealing with a ridiculous amount of data, like that just works totally fine. Yeah, I, I think so. I, I guess, yeah, that's my kind of my number one thought about all of these, these questions is there's a lot of good advice out there, but it really depends on who you are and what your situation is. So, right. you know, with, with the amount of data that I have, which honestly is not that much, this kind of thing is, is more than enough. And even worst case scenario, even if that failed, I've been sending every single event to my event, uh, my event analytics provider, so I could still rebuild. I would, I wouldn't necessarily want to rely on this, but I, I still should be able to rebuild any important app state that I need, as far as like anyone's membership status or that kind of thing. Yeah, that's really good. So it's like multiple levels of redundancy if something fails. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think it's it's probably a lot more redundancy than was normal for much bigger businesses, say five, ten years ago. Right, but for those uh, those SQL dumps, are you just putting those on the instance itself, or like a block storage with DigitalOcean or S three buckets, or? Uh, it's the DigitalOcean's equivalent of S three buckets. It's uh, Spaces. Yeah, that's a really cool service too. What is it like five bucks a month, and you get like two hundred and fifty gigs of space and. A CDN? I, th I think that's right. I, I don't remember because I've I've been getting 
uh, DigitalOcean credits from the referral program. So the last I remember having to pay them was like $6 a month. Right. Yeah, it's awesome. When it comes to other types of like alerting, you know, we, we talked about having the DigitalOcean alert set up. Do you have anything checking like like the like a health endpoint of your app? Oh, like a, like a pingdom or something like that. Yeah, exactly. I don't. I don't. I've I've been planning on setting that up. Basically, just having my other server being the Alchemist Camp server, um, right. maybe once a minute or something. But I'm not. So the only I would say the only uh, alert that I have is that I'm on the site many times a day, every day. Yeah, that definitely helps. Like I do that too sometimes. Like it's so weird. Like I actually I have one of those health checks uh, services set up. I don't know if you've ever heard of Uptime Robot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're really cool. Like they have a really generous free plan where you can have like I think twenty or so sites hooked up to it, and they just ping it every five minutes. You get an email if it's down. But still, for whatever reason, like part of my morning routine is like, does it really work? Like it's almost like you can't believe that the site is still off. So you take it down for ten minutes and see if you get an alert. Not even that. Like, I'll just look at the site and just be like, is it really working? Yes, it's really working. Even though technically Uptime Robot will be checking that, it's like, I just don't believe it sometimes because it's crazy when you don't get that alert from them for like, you know, a year straight. It's like, is the, is their service even working? Well, that's kind of how I feel about the DigitalOcean alerts, like about CPU usage, memory, all that stuff, because I've done load testing and I never get one of those alerts. Yeah, it's it's kind of funny how that works. It's like, you're just in disbelief that it actually works. <laughs> I think bandwidth is probably the constraining factor for me. I think that's probably why I haven't seen it. Right. Like if it were to hit its limit, it would be because it just they can't send that much. So I, I think we covered pretty much everything from uh, you know the development to the production side of things. So wrapping this up, um, do you have any advice for others who are running like similar stacks in production? Like what are your best tips and, and lessons learned? Um, well, if it's similar situation as me, like if you're a single person building something for profit in your own time on the side, my biggest advice would be not to worry too much early on and just do the simpler thing, get it working and increase in complexity and so on as you go, because there's so much time that people spend you know, with, with complex infrastructure or, you know, elaborate uh, design flourishes or all kinds of things that uh, never really get seen by anyone because they're not making something that anyone wants. And they, they don't know yet because they've, you know, they've been siloed in their, in their room coding for, for weeks or months. Right. It just becomes like, like an information, like paralysis type of thing. Like you're just overloaded and nothing gets done because you don't know where to start. Yeah, I think I think making some mistakes is fine. Obviously, uh, be ethical about it. But I I think people are more forgiving than I thought they were, at least when I uh, first started working on my own stuff. So so speaking of mistakes, um, if you're up to it, do you want to go over some mistakes that you made in the past, and then maybe how you corrected them? Yeah, um, on this project, I don't think it's been too bad. Let me think here. Oh no, I did have, I had one uh, very major mistake actually. And that is uh, I set up, I set up uh, some region-based discounts and there was a customer in one region who, uh, who saw a discount that wasn't the correct price. And this was not because I'd made a mistake in the region discount code. But I actually made a display mistake just on the the template that rendered for it. And it was it was only one region, but I had I had basically mistyped the region's coupon code, and they saw a drastically better discount they should have gotten, and they bought it, and they were charged uh, the amount that was that was intended, and they emailed me and they're like, hey, what's going on here? Like I suggest you answer this quickly. And I, oh, man. I just explained exactly what happened. I apologized. I refunded it, and said, you know, I can't, I can't give this almost for free. Um, and I'm sorry about this. Please understand. Like, there's nothing malicious here. I'm just, you know, one person working on this, and it was, you know, a bug in my display code. And I've, 
you know, written this kind of test to make sure it doesn't happen again. And, um, you know, everything was fine and they, they have, uh, uh, continued on as a user and may, uh, may yet end up being a customer in the future. But that was, that was probably the, the scariest one by far. <laughs> I, I love stories like that. Not because like you made a mistake, but it's so weird because developers are like some of the most like picky and like deterministic people ever. But at the same time, it's like, yeah, if you have like a bug in your code and, you, and you're just open with people, I think developers are one of the most like lax people around. Like they totally get it. And, and it's great to hear that he just came on board as a regular customer now. Yeah, I, I think the concern was just that, you know, it was like a really sleazy strategy of mine to like show a discount and then it's actually a smaller discount, which um, obviously isn't the case. But Unfortunately, the internet's a big place and uh, there probably are other sites doing exactly that. Yeah, so the price parity discount stuff is is definitely tricky to implement. That's something that I haven't worked on yet, but it's something I would like to do. It's Yeah, it's, uh, it's a bit of a nail bar biter because obviously I don't want to, uh, I don't want to disincentivize everyone who's not from, say, Nigeria or India or a really, you know, low purchasing power area. Right. Yeah, so that that would be my my uh, my last tip and story of a, a a big mistake that could have been worse. Cool. So, Mark, thanks a lot for coming on the Running in Production podcast. It was great talking with you. Um, before we wrap this up, do you want to share any links to your site, YouTube channel, Twitter account, GitHub profile, stuff like that? Yeah, sure thing. It's great talking to you as well. My Twitter is Alchemist Camp, all one word, and the one place I'd like to send people to would be alchemist.camp slash podcasts, where I've got a code and bootstrapping podcast that covers uh, uh, probably a good overlap with uh, what we're doing here. Uh, thanks again. Yeah, no problem. And on that note, to everyone listening, thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you in the next one. You've been listening to the Running in Production podcast. You can find a full archive of the show at runninginproduction.com. Also, don't forget to subscribe using your favorite podcast player or leave a review if you like the show.